Today, Pepsi is the number two soda in the world. Throughout its existence, it has jockeyed for the number one spot, achieving it here and there for brief periods, but always losing it to their ancient rival, Coca-Cola. With one notable exception, the Soviet Union. For almost two decades, Pepsi was not only the number one soft drink in the Soviet Union, it was the only soft drink. With the help of Richard Nixon and a savvy businessman, Pepsi was able to penetrate the Iron Curtain and become the first foreign consumer good to be sold in the USSR. This really led to Pepsi becoming a global military power. In 1959, with the very real possibility of a full-scale nuclear exchange hanging over their populations, the world's superpowers agreed to battle each other with something a little less apocalyptic a limited cultural exchange. In the summer, the Soviets bombarded New York City with an exhibition showing off the technological achievements and industrial prowess of a communist centralized economy. One month later, the US responded, striking Moscow with a salvo of capitalist ingenuity and free market wizardry. Then Vice President Richard Nixon arrived armed with consumer products from IBM, Cadillac, RCA, Disney, and Dixie Cups. But when the dust cleared, one product would stand out amongst them all, Pepsi. And that was no coincidence. Along with Richard Nixon and the Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, there was another man present. When you look at photos of the event, he's the one pouring the Pepsi into the Dixie Cups. This was Donald Kendall. Kendall was in charge of international marketing for Pepsi. Getting the soft drink into the Soviet Union was his ultimate goal. No foreign products whatsoever were allowed in the country. But here was his chance. Fortunately, Kendall happened to be friends with the Vice President of the United States. So Nixon pulled some strings and had a soda machine installed in the exhibition that dispensed Pepsi and only Pepsi. Russian attendees, including the Soviet Premier, got their first taste of the beverage. Although suspicious of it at first, Pepsi was a hit. This jump-started Kendall's career, and in a few years, he would be CEO. Under his command, Pepsi negotiated an exclusive contract with the Soviet Union in the early 70s, becoming the first and only American product distributed in the USSR. Not even Coca-Cola could compete with that. But there was one snag. The Soviets couldn't pay for it. The ruble was worthless on international markets, and the Soviets were legally prohibited from accepting foreign currency. So to seal this deal, Pepsi would have to accept something other than currency in return. Luckily, Russia had plenty of another type of beverage, vodka. So they would trade that for Pepsi, and Pepsi would in turn sell that vodka in the US for real money. And it worked for nearly two decades. But in the spring of 1989, the Soviet Union was going through some tough times. The Soviets had been fighting and losing a war in Afghanistan for a better part of the decade. This had ignited an international backlash, which spurred a boycott against Russian products in the US, one of those products being vodka. As a result, the Soviets would have to find something else of value to trade for their precious Pepsi. By now, the USSR's status as a global superpower was quickly fading. Decades of economic stagnation and political discontent had hobbled the country. But it still retained many of the features that made it a global superpower in the first place, namely a gigantic military. So the Soviets gave Pepsi part of their navy in exchange for $3 billion worth of Pepsi syrup. And that's how, in April of 1989, Pepsi came into possession of three warships, a few oil tankers, and 17 submarines, an entire flotilla. Pepsi eventually leased out a few of the ships and sold the rest for scrap. But for a brief period of time, a food and beverage company was in possession of the sixth largest submarine fleet in the world, thanks to a disintegrating superpower. Pepsi isn't the only American product to get an unusual trade deal with the Soviet Union. In 1989, that same year, Bon Jovi released its album New Jersey to the Russian public, the first American rock band to do so with the consent of the Soviet authorities. In lieu of royalties, they were given a shipment of wood, which they sold to a guitar company in the US. Of course, the fleet Pepsi received was decommissioned. The ships and subs would have been useless in any real sea battle. They probably didn't even run. So Pepsi's status as a global military power was entirely symbolic. But symbolism would soon have very real consequences for Pepsi. In a few short years, the Soviet Union would be gone, and with it, Pepsi's lucrative and one-of-a-kind trade deal. After the fall of communism, the new Russian Federation would be flooded with consumer products, including Pepsi's longtime rival, Coca-Cola. Now faced with competition, Pepsi resorted to extravagant marketing gimmicks, erecting billboards over the historic Pushkin Square and launching an oversized mock-up of a Pepsi can to the Mir space station. But Pepsi was seen as a vestige of the old system, of communism. Coca-Cola was novel and came to symbolize a new way of life. Eventually, the billboards came down, as did the Mir space station. Without its state-sanctioned monopoly, Pepsi could not hold on to its number one spot. Coca-Cola ultimately won out. Just as communism fell, so did Pepsi, 
and its glorious soda empire, along with its brief military might, are now relegated to the recycling bin of history. <laughs>